Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, for this program in observance of Earth Week slash Earth Day. Um, we're going to just take it a, one more minute while folks are still joining the uh, the meeting. But um, just very quickly, uh, my name is Dan. I am the director of development and programming for the Bedford Playhouse. Um, I want to thank everybody for taking a few minutes. Um, tonight for uh, what I'm sure is gonna be a really great program. Uh, and before I introduce our moderator to you uh, for this evening, just wanna remind everybody um, how to ask a question. Uh, I'm sure everybody is quite accustomed to using Zoom uh, at this point, but for those of you who aren't, there is a button at the bottom of your screen that says Q&A. And we ask you to please use that feature. Uh, you can ask a question at any time uh, during the course of the discussion and uh, there will be time um, towards the end dedicated to uh, answering your questions as best as many as we can in the uh, time that we've been allotted. Um, please try to not use the chat feature. Uh, it just gets a little bit confusing, but certainly um, if you do, we will do our best to address your, your questions there. Um, I should just mention uh, that we all, uh, both the Bedford Playhouse and Bedford 2030, um, rely on the support of the community. So if you have a few moments, if you enjoy the program, please visit our websites um, and consider making contributions to help us with our respective missions. Uh, this is the second night uh, of Bedford Playhouse Earth Week programming. We got off to a great start last night. I'm sure this is going to be um, uh, just as informative and enlightening. And uh, we are recording tonight, so this recording will be up on our YouTube channel in the next couple of days, and we will share the link with everyone uh, who may want to either revisit it or share it with anyone else who might be interested. Uh, with all that being said, uh, I want to introduce our moderator, uh, who's Sarah Douglas. Uh, Sarah, hey. She's going to tell you a little bit about herself and then introduce our panel. And uh, Sarah, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Dan, and thank you to the Bedford Playhouse for your resilience through this pandemic. You're an incredible convener for our community, and we're so glad that you're back in action. And for all of you out there, please support the Bedford Playhouse because it it's very, very important. And thank you for promoting Earth Week. It is um, one of my favorite weeks of the year. I devote my life to protecting the planet. And I'm thrilled that the Bedford Playhouse has created this amazing week of programming so that the community can, can learn about protecting the planet. So thank you very much for having me. And I'm thrilled to be here on behalf of Bedford 2030. For those of you that do not know Bedford 2030, it is a local small but mighty grassroots organization that is working on the urgent issue of climate change here by reducing our greenhouse gases in our town. It is an incredible organization where we meet you where you are. So if you're interested in the environment and you don't know much about it, please go to our website. It's an incredible site. It's brand new. It's got tons of resources for your home, for your yard, for our community. And we would love for you to join us. Bedford 2030 was founded back in 2009 by three amazing women leaders here in this community, Olivia Farr, Ellen Conrad, and Mary Beth Cass. They dreamt up this dream to create a, the very first climate action plan in the state of New York. And it was just the three of them. And they grew a very engaged board. And now we have the leadership of Midge Iorio, our amazing executive director, and our incredible president, Karen Sabbath. And they set out in 2009 with a very ambitious goal to reduce the greenhouse gases in the town of Bedford by 20%. Well, we hit the cover off the ball and we were able to reduce the greenhouse gases in the town of Bedford by 44% early on time to 2019. So now we had to sit as a group and say, what are we gonna do the next 10 years? So we we're thrilled uh, in January to be able to launch our next 10 years of climate action now here in the town of Bedford. And we're hoping that you will join us in that mission. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit about our climate action plan for the next 10 years. We learned a lot in our 2017 greenhouse gas inventory. 
And we are focusing on six different areas in the Climate Action Plan. And that would be 100% green energy, high performance buildings, transportation, sustainable food practices, water and land, and waste and recycling. So those are all very important issues. You'll be very surprised to learn that the town of Bedford's greenhouse gases, 48% of them actually come from transportation and high performance buildings. So we are hoping to inspire you as we launch our programming and the world emerges from this crazy pandemic. We are hoping to inspire you to join us. We're going to be having a Make Your Next Car an EV program. We are going to be having um, also a, um, um, our waste and recycling, which is a wildly successful community compost program. We also have a pilot and curbside compost as well. And we're absolutely thrilled that we have very ambitious goals for the next 10 years to reduce our greenhouse gases in the town of Bedford by 80%. So what do we need to do that? We need you and we need this next generation of climate leaders and we need everybody to come together to help us on this mission. It is the greatest existential crisis of our time. I get a little choked up saying it, it's true. And today we have four amazing young women, girl power, to be able to talk about what they've been able to do on Climate Action Now, whether it's in their homes, in their communities, in their schools, all through our program, Bedford 2030 launched six years ago called the Greenlight Awards. And it is a program for high school students all over uh, Westchester and beyond to be able to compete in a challenge. It's a little bit like a shark tank. It's a almost a nine month cycle that these kids are committed to, which is incredible. These are busy kids with sports and all kinds of schedules and they are committed to creating green innovations, advocacy campaigns and Bedford 2030 is there to support them. We bring them experts to learn from. We bring them tools and resources. We even offer funding for their projects. So they come with an idea and we help them execute it. Last weekend was our Greenlight Awards for this year, our sixth year, and it was so inspiring. We had teams from uh, 19 or 20 different high schools. And uh, one of our panelists um, actually competed in it on Saturday. And tomorrow the winners will be announced on Instagram Live and Facebook Live. So um, we'd love for you to learn a little bit about the Green Light Award. And so um, let's roll the video. The Greenlight Award is a competition that challenges local high school students to use leadership and innovation in order to bring about environmental change in their homes, schools, and communities. Hi, my name is Leia and I'm a sophomore. Hi, my name is Krish. Hi, my name is Jordan. My name is Aaron. I'm Julia. And I'm Gabby. For our Greenlight Project. My Greenlight Project. My Greenlight Project. Our Greenlight Project is called the Confronting Climate Challenge. And our goal is to educate people about human impact on climate change. We are designing an app to encourage users to build constructive habits around the carbon footprint. This program inspires and empowers students to come up with big green ideas to solve the climate crisis and other sustainability issues affecting our community. Reducing single-use plastics, changing shopping habits, and reducing fossil fuels. It's an app that will help raise awareness about and encourage fuel efficient driving in our community. We have been collecting clothes from our community to put them up on a website. This will prevent the overproduction of clothes. By allowing users to track their plastic consumption, people will begin reducing their plastic usage. We can save so many tons of carbon emissions every year. This will save natural resources and reduce pollution, habitat loss, and climate change. Our overall goal is to encourage users to, uh, to incorporate green behaviors into their daily life. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
That was a little video from our green light participants. And I did forget two um, exciting things that Bed for 2030 is doing this year. Um, around buildings. So we're inspiring homeowners and businesses to reduce their greenhouse gases to become more energy efficient so that you can do this in your homes and in your businesses. So we will give you tools to help reduce your greenhouse gases. So please log on to our website and learn how to do that, whether it's heating and cooling pumps, whether it's solar energy efficiency, or even geothermal. Um, and then a very exciting initiative that we're launching this summer that's brand new from two of our board members, Carolyn McGill and Karen Simons. They have brought to us an incredible soil sequestration project and we're calling it Carbon Drawdown. We're actually le leveraging Mother Earth to help us sequester carbon. And they have a very detailed map, Bedford, where we're learning where all of the soils are and how we work with them. And as we learn, we will teach you and have you join us so that you can do this in your yard and on your property as well. So back to the green light. The green light is my most inspiring part of Bedford 2030, seeing these kids come up with ideas. There's ideas from you know apps to all kinds of inventions to community advocacy pro programs. And tonight we're going to learn from this next generation of climate leaders. We are living in a time when the youth voice is what is making a difference. We have handed them a mess and it's our responsibility to lift their voices up. They're using their voices, they're using their minds to come up with innovations and they're making impact. So please, Help me welcome our panelists tonight. We have an alumni who has moved on to university now, as she was actually our 2018 winner, Rachel Joseph. And we have our, right out of Pound Ridge, we have Riley Hester. And Riley has created a project um, last year in the Greenlight Awards that is also lives on in the community of Pound Ridge. And we'll learn all about it. But I'm very inspired that she took her climate action and her inspiration to the town board of Pound Ridge who listened and helped her. And now she has a program Recycle Right with Riley here in the town of Pound Ridge. And she'll actually be on this Saturday, and Riley, I'll let you tell a little bit more about it, but this Saturday, there is going to be a low waste exhibit in the town of Pound Ridge, where uh, the conservation board and the town have come together to teach people all about living a low waste um, lifestyle, and Riley's gonna be a part of that. And then we have from John Jay, a very big job, Sarah Kelleher who is contestant this Saturday and last year, I think she was also a finalist in Greenlight. And Sarah runs the Sustainability Club at John Jay and is um, doing incredible projects there as well. And then we have Jasmine Sizer, who lives a very green lifestyle. She was a contestant last year um, in, in the pandemic. Unfortunately, her Greenlight project was challenged in obstacles by, by COVID, but was still amazing. But her commitment to the planet and her daily lifestyle living to live in a way that is conducive to um, preserving natural resources is really inspiring. So I'm absolutely thrilled to have these four incredible ladies here. And we're gonna talk a little bit about their experience in the Greenlight Award. And then we're also gonna talk about the environment in general and some of the issues that they care deeply about and why. And it is my hope tonight that as a takeaway, you, the viewers, will think of one thing that you can do to protect the planet. It could be small. It could be big, like learning how to compost. It could be turning off the lights when you go out of a room, whatever it is. Pick one takeaway, whether it's from these inspiring next gen leaders, whether it's from the Bedford 2030 website, or whether it's from something that you're reading all through Climate Week, please help us and join us in Climate Action Now. So now I'd like to introduce our panelists. And um, Rachel, I'd like to start with you as our alum 
Um, Rachel is, well, I'll let you explain. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your connection to Greenlight. Sure. Thank you, Sarah. Um, my name is Rachel Joseph. I'm from Katona. Um, and I did Greenlight in 2018 for my project on rainwater harvesting, where I installed a rainwater harvesting system at our local elementary school. Um, currently, I'm a second year chemical engineering student at Northeastern University. Wonderful. Can you tell us a little bit about your, um, your Greenlight project and how you conceived of it? Sure. Um, so what really inspired this interest in rainwater harvesting um, was uh, taking a trip to India um, a few years back. Um, in India, it's really common to harvest rainwater because of the heavy monsoon season. So when we were visiting family, um, I noticed that almost every house we went to had it. Um, so I really appreciated this concept of, of turning rain, um, which is something that we usually don't pay much attention to, um, into something that's so vital for watering uh, the garden and for using it for outside uses. Um, so that's really what inspired that. Um, and it was also because I wanted to uh, foster the growth of our community garden at the elementary school. Um, teachers were finding it really hard to take time to garden and um, to water it. And it was, the burden was really falling on the teachers. So I wanted to find a way um, to make it easier on the teachers because um, the community garden was something I grew up with and I, I wanted that tradition to stay. That is wonderful. And I remember being inspired by the fact that you took a, an, an innovation from the, the country where your roots are, are born and then brought it here to our community so that we could learn from it. So thank you for doing that, Rachel. And now um, tell us a little bit about what you're studying and what your, what your hopes and dreams going forward are just so we have context for the conversation. Sure. Um, so I started out studying environmental engineering here, but um, I switched over into chemical engineering. Um, and really what I'm interested in is um, the intersection between engineering and policy within the energy sector. So I'm not exactly sure um, what I see myself doing, but um, I know that I want to be somewhere in between engineering and policy, um, specifically regarding energy um, in the US. Excellent. And um, Jasmine, tell us a little bit about yourself and um, your connection to Greenlight. I'm a junior at Fox Lane High School and I participated in the Greenlight Award last year, as you said, and my project was to, me and my two friends, we advocated for compacting trash cans at our high school in order to decrease the volume of the total waste and then also decrease the amount of garbage truck runs back and forth from the school to the waste and then overall decrease the carbon emissions from that. Awesome. And tell us a little bit about um, your journey in climate action. Like where did it start from? Um, well, my journey, all well, I always grew up loving the environment because my father is an environmentalist. And so I always understood the beauties of the earth. And then two years ago, I went scuba diving in Belize for the first time ever. And when we went scuba diving, I was wrapped into this whole new world of the ocean. And many of my friends, they speak about the ocean and how they fear it because it's like the unknown or whatever. But when I was in the world of the unknown, I came to like to love it and I saw how beautiful it really is. And it just inspired me and I was just so captivated by it. And ever since I just always look back on that moment as to why I'm doing what I want to do now and for the future. Well, thank you for caring the ocean. The oceans need you too, they need all of us. And um, Sarah, tell us a little bit about yourself and your connection to Greenlight. Um, so I'm a senior at John Jay and I'm the head of the sustainability club um, at John Jay. And we've competed in the Greenlight competition for the past two years. So 
Last year, we actually placed second with our sustainability week project that we host at the school right before we went into quarantine last March. And then the finals for this year actually took place last weekend. And we don't have the results back, but um, we competed with our bi-monthly action campaigns that we have been working on this year, um, like half remote and half in school um, for Greenlight. Awesome. And tell us a little bit about what inspired your climate action. This is a good, a good one. Um, yeah, so at John Jay, they offer humanities research, which is a two year honors research course. And you can basically study anything, but your first year in sophomore year, you work as a class to like read books and do research on general themes. So we research like wealth and equity and racial justice and also climate change. And so this kind of really um, made me passionate about social justice. It really kind of got me going and got me really excited about it. And as I started to learn about all this social injustice in America, I realized that we're not really, we're, we're very limited in what we're doing to combat all of these issues. And also all of them are really intertwined. So it made me feel like I really had to do something and I really had to like get out there and like try to, help combat it in any way that I could, even though like I'm just a high school student, I can't make that much of an impact. And so I heard that the sustainability club was starting back up again and I immediately got involved and I wanted to help out as much as I could. That is amazing, Sarah, and you are correct. Social justice and environmental justice are absolutely interconnected. And I'm so glad that you've taken up this, this fight and we're all, we're all benefiting and your whole school is benefiting from your passion and enthusiasm for sure. And now Riley, Hester, tell us a little bit about you and your connection to Greenlight. So I'm a sophomore at Fox Lane High School and I was a Greenlight finalist last year for my project Recycle Right with Riley, which I've continued on with. And it focuses on increasing recycling in Pound Ridge and also giving people the resources that they need in order to make it easier for them to recycle in Pound Ridge and in general. Excellent. And what made you, how did you um, start your climate action journey with this idea? How was so, right with Riley born? <laughs> so what initially inspired me to start my journey was about two years ago, I watched the documentary, A Plastic Ocean, which shows the extreme amount of pollution and plastics in the ocean. And as someone who loves the ocean, this was very upsetting. And I knew that I had to do something about this. So I started researching different recycling programs and ways to recycle different items. And then I became connected with the Pound Ridge Conservation Board and then they inspired me to start my green light project and do something about the recycling in my town. Wonderful. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about the Green Light Award because we are inspiring kids all over to apply for this very innovative program where we will help to support these ideas become, you know, the reality. And um, so I was hoping that each of you could, could talk a little bit about the Greenlight Award and what kinds of um, support you got or how the, you know, what you learned from the experience because there's a lot that goes into it. It's advocacy, it's public speaking, it's campaign planning, it's innovation and um, all of those things wrapped up in one and you've got to consult experts in the community and you've got to create a project. So we want to learn about your experience. So Rachel, what did you learn? Yeah, I had a really rewarding um, experience um, through Greenlight. Um, I really appreciated the incubator workshops that um, we had throughout. Uh, it really helped me like solidify an idea. Um, but I think the, the main thing I took away was my appreciation um, for collaborating with a diverse range of people. Um, I never thought I'd be working so closely with custodians and school administrators and 
um, teachers. Uh, so that was a really fun experience to interact with people I normally wouldn't um, on this exciting project. Um, and I also think something that I also took away was the challenges of bringing an idea that we just came up with in an ideation incubator workshop and actually making that a reality. So um, that's something I'm still learning as an engineer now, but um, that's something I had to navigate um, through Green Light. It's a, it's, a, it's a lifelong learning, Rachel, <laughs> all of the challenges and obstacles that come in our way, but we're so inspired by your work. Thank you. And um, Sarah, how about you? Um, what did you learn from the Greenlight Award and, and working with the school, as we know, at Bedford 2030, trying to get this program into schools? And um, Gail Record has been really instrumental this year. Um, the Greenlight Awards was invented by our amazing group and sponsored by um, Curtis Instruments here in, in town in Mount Kisco. And Ellen Calves, who is now a town board member, but she really carried Greenlight on her back and learned the hard way of all of the obstacles and challenges that come with working with schools and administrators. And Gail Record has taken it upon herself this year as our Greenlight um, lead. And boy, oh boy, we learn a lot about, about schools this way. So Sarah, do you wanna tell us a little bit about your experience with Greenlight and working with students and administrators and maybe some of the obstacles and challenges you came up against? Yeah, definitely. I think um, in terms of green light, I definitely learned a, a few important skills, especially last year being the first year. I definitely learned about organization and also like being a leader and how to kind of organize and put together not only a smooth running project with like little to no issues, but also a group and leading a group of people who maybe aren't friends or maybe don't know each other um, and getting the same goal that you all have accomplished. And I think that Greenlight really helped me with that because um, they definitely offer a lot of connections. And I learned a lot about connection making from Greenlight. So like in December for the first um, initial presentation for the competition, um, I was presenting to Lauren Broyce from Sustainable Westchester. She was one of our judges that we were kind of making our pitch to, I guess you could say, about our project idea. And then she like immediately gave us her number and her email. And then we really used her as a mentor and um, a resource throughout the year on our project. And she was really, really, like really helpful in helping us um, kind of knowing what steps to make and, and how to um, accomplish our goal. And she even helped us to, alongside Bedford 2030 to host a webinar last week about reducing fossil fuel emission in the homes. And um, like, it was kind of unbelievable that we got to do that as part of our fossil fuel energy um, action campaign for the month of March. But it was really because of kind of the, the leadership skills and the connection making skills that Greenlight kind of um, helped me gain. Well, that is excellent to know. And Lauren Royce is a special advisor to our board at Bedford 2030, and we feel like she is an absolute treasure as well. So I'm glad that she was helpful for, for you and your project. Riley, I know the pandemic has certainly thrown a little bit of a, a wrench in, in the continuation of your project. Um, but you, do you want to tell us a little bit about how that worked with the municipality making change? Yeah, so I think I learned a lot about working with different people and businesses to put in recycling boxes and in certain storefronts and to have tabling events like at the market at Pound Ridge. And I think I also learned a lot about communicating and negotiating with people with these recycling boxes and about how the cost of recycling comes into play. And then with these businesses, that helped me a lot with learning about how to market my project and using all the resources that the businesses and Greenlight were giving me to fully execute my project. And also all of these experiences with the businesses and Greenlight 
helped me realize how important it is for us, especially as young people, to address these climate issues and the lack of recycling and to encourage change because there's so many people who just have no idea about recycling or their carbon footprints or anything like that, so. That is awesome, Riley, and you're absolutely right. It is about changing behavior, especially around recycling. And, you know, I'm at all of these environmental conferences and events and things. And when I speak, I often say, how many of you are confused at the bin? And you would be so surprised to see so many grown up hands go up um, because recycling is confusing and it's hard to understand what's recycled and what's not. And what Riley's done is she has created very hard to recycle items, collection points around Pound Ridge to collect corks and um, razor blades at the barber and mascara wands to clean animals that have been in oil spills. So it's, it's a very inventive way to help inspire that behavior change around waste. And Jasmine, I know that the pandemic also kind of thwarted your, your project as well, but I'd love for you because you on this panel are really representing um, green lifestyle and green home. And I just have to tell like one side story. So there was someone at, at Bedford 2030 knows Jasmine. And she said that when she eats lunch with her son, her son is like, mom, I can't have Ziplocs. I'm eating with Jasmine today. So we're really proud of Jasmine for being that advocate in her daily life. So do you wanna talk about some of the challenges and obstacles just about inspiring others to care about the planet in your daily life? Um, yeah, in my daily life, it definitely is hard to get people to agree with you or see where you're coming from because I definitely am very passionate for the environment and people don't really understand why and it's hard to come up, it's hard to express it to them. But from green light and from my personal experiences, I have learned from all of this that kind of like what Riley said, that when you really want something or want to do something or make a change, you can always do it. You just have to imp really implement that idea and show the facts and just really express your love for it and your passions and people, it will come off, it will rub off on other people. And also through green light, something that I have learned kind of like what Sarah said is that I am this year taking science research and in science research, we do a lot of presentations and green light was probably one of the first experiences that really offered a public speaking opportunity to me. So it really allowed me to practice that and present to judges. And it was a really good experience for me in the future with school and for the future to come as well. Excellent. Um, well, you talk about the facts and we do have a few slides of facts. We're not trying to get all gloom and doom on you, but I did ask these esteemed panelists what kinds of climate issues are really heavy on their heart? I, I use different language. I said, you know, what really makes you mad? So, um, Aaron, do you want to show a little bit of the slides? Um, I, I would like to start with, with, with mine, which is food waste. So food waste is something that is a real consumer issue. If food waste was a country, it would be the third largest emitter of greenhouse gases. When you throw food out in your garbage and your garbage goes to a landfill, it actually makes gas that is going into the environment. And when food is actually composted, and I, listen, I moved from Brooklyn to Pound Ridge and I really tried to be that eco mom that composted in my backyard. And let me tell you, it is a science to get that black gold of like the perfect mix of organic with the brown. And I had like maggots and it just really wasn't working out so well, but thank goodness there's community compost. So Bedford 2030 created a community compost program of which the town of Pound Ridge has adopted. And now you can bring your compost. So I literally, today I filled my compost bag. It feels like a small child. It's like 20 pounds of compost. And it's so wonderful to know that it's not going into a landfill. There's also curbside compost that you can do. 
which is a service and a company that comes to do it. There's a pilot, a Beverage 2030 pilot for, for curbside compost as well. So if anybody is willing to take a big leap and make the one thing that they change their behavior about for composting, please reach out to us because we're ready to meet you where you are um, to, to learn. Um, Riley, since you're focused on and very heated about recycling as a consumer issue, um, do you want to tell us a little bit about recycling as an issue? Erin? Yeah, so there's so much plastic that is produced that is not recycled and a lot of plastic that they kind of confuse you because they have the little triangle on the containers and on the bags, but a lot of it doesn't end up getting recycled and it can end up getting burned in the ocean, in landfills, and just in our environment in general, which is really upsetting because you think you're putting it in the recycle bin and it's going to just end up back into the ocean. And also there's a lot of small changes that we can do that to prevent this from happening. So this is kind of a little plug here, but you can check out my website for Recycle Right. It's www.recyclerightwithriley.com. And that gives you just some more information on what items can be recycled where and what items you can't recycle just so we can help prevent the ocean and the environment from getting more plastic, which is very unnecessary. And I think that something that is very important is everyone should just try to make small changes in their lives for about with the recycling habits. And during my green light project, I actually asked people to pledge to recycle a little bit more because I think that those small behavior changes are what in the long run will create big change. And if everyone decides to make just one small change in their recycling habits, in the long run, it's going to really add up. Thank you, Riley. And I'm glad that you gave the plug for Recycle Right with for Riley. I definitely use that as a resource for sure. Do you wanna give a little bit of plug of, of what time you'll be in the village of Pound Ridge on Saturday doing Recycle Right with with Riley so that um, any of our viewers could come by and learn from you? Yeah, so at the market in Pound Ridge from I think it's 10 to three on this Saturday, there's a whole low waste exhibit and you can go and learn about how to reduce your waste. There's, I'm gonna be there with my Recycle Right with Riley resources. And there's lots of other people who, who will be there. There's information on composting, on the repair cafe, on the take it or leave it shed, and just all these great resources to help you reduce your waste. Amazing. And reducing our waste is really the best thing that you can do. Only 9% of what we put in our recycling bin is actually recycled. So it's called, in our industry, people we call it wish cycling, like you wish that it was recycled. All of the thin film, those Ziploc, saran wrap, your newspaper wrap, that's not recyclable. It's going into your recycling and it's contaminating that bag. And that bag will then need to go to a landfill or get incinerated. So it's unable to actually get recycled. Just, and as Riley so well pointed out, just because it has a little triangle with arrows does not mean that it's recyclable in our towns. So understand what is recyclable and what is not, and definitely check out Riley's map and the, the low waste. If you live in Bedford, we'll talk about a little bit about this at the end, but there is a Healthy Yards Earth Day Festival this weekend, or, or May 2nd. Um, and they will also have composting and learning about recycling and a plant swap and all kinds of great things too. Um, so um, let's talk about Jasmine because we just learned about how much ocean, there will be more plastic in the ocean than fish in 2050. So let's talk a little bit about that with Jasmine. 
Um, so as I mentioned before, I am study I'm in science research and in science research, I'm studying coral bleaching and um, coral bleaching is becoming more and more prevalent due to human action. And as you can see in the slide, 75% of the world's coral reefs are at risk and about a quarter of them have already been damaged beyond repair. I know that 50% of corals have been damaged and I think in the next 30 years, a predicted 40% more is about to become damaged. So that's a lot of coral and corals are very necessary to us and the earth. For example, um, they hold the homes to many marine organisms and without corals, then many of these marine organisms will also go with them. And corals are also very important to us because they act as a barrier between the waves and the shore. So not only to the marine organisms, they are important to us. And I just have been thinking that I just, this makes me inspired to do more because we can start in our own homes to help save even something so far as corals, which are in a huge amount of threat right now. <laughs> Thank you for caring about the corals. When we when we live so far away from coral reefs, it's sometimes out of our mind and it's really, really important. Ocean health is paramount. We, we need the ocean for oxygen and we need it um, clean. So thank you for, for caring about that. Um, Sarah, tell us about what makes you really mad. <laughs> Um, so I think single use plastic water bottles are definitely a big thing for me that kind of get me going. Um, I think most people in general just don't really have a, a good understanding on how negative of an impact these bottles can have on the environment and people just kind of buy big packages of them at the grocery store and they don't really realize um, what impact they're making. And so as, as the slide says like um, I just think like people don't understand they don't really ever go away or if they do it takes literal centuries for them to do that and they just kind of break down into smaller and smaller pieces which are called microplastics and as they do break, break down this way they release greenhouse gases which obviously contributes to global warming and so overall like these bottles they they're just kind of terrible for the environment because they not only pile up and pollute um, the environment because they're being wasted, but they also emit these gases that break down and are just kind of so harmful. And I don't think people really understand how dangerous they are. They just kind of think, oh, you know, I'm going to get this water because it tastes better or something. When they could do easy, easy changes if they don't like their at-home water. Like they could just buy a Brita filter for like $20 at Target or something. And it's kind of simple to have a, a pretty big impact on our environment. Absolutely. So please bring a refillable water bottle. I bring a refillable water bottle wherever I can go. And much to my kids' dismay, when we go to like a food truck Friday or something like that, I'm always carrying around these reusable water bottles because I really try our best to not buy the single use plastic bottles. I think around waste, you know, we've talked a lot about waste. It's rethinking it. You know, do you really need that plastic bag for your vegetables when you're at the market? Is that something that you really need when you have, you know, a, a thing of bananas that already has mother nature's uh, bag on it, which is a peel. Do you really, you know, it's not like you're putting the banana peel in your mouth. So you're gonna peel that off. So it's okay if that actually goes on the conveyor belt. That's one less thin film plastic bag that you have used. Same thing goes for water bottles. It's really easy for moms to drive around with a big case of water from Costco in the back of their, their car and pass it out to kids who take two or three sips of it and then it just ends up on a sidewalk or might end up in a recycling can. But it's still, we have way too many plastic water bottles as you learned from Sarah. So please do your best and reduce your consumption. And um, Rachel's interest, and Rachel's really taken her green light experience and her passion for the environment into her chemical engineering major. And um, 
we do have a question from the audience about, you know, what is next? And it sounds like there's an issue that you really are interested in tackling. Yeah, um, so I'm really passionate about energy justice. Um, so on the slide, it says 770 million people still lack access to electricity worldwide. And that's just one component of energy injustice. So what energy justice really is, it's this concept and this goal that we're working towards not only a clean energy future, um, but also that it's equitable in terms of social and economic participation of people in the energy sector. Um, so last semester, I did this semester long group project where we mapped energy burden throughout the state of Massachusetts. Um, and essentially energy burden is the percentage of a family's income that goes towards paying for energy bills. And what our team found was that in areas and communities of low income um, minority communities, um, they were paying much higher percentages of their income towards um, electricity bills. And so that's something that I'm really passionate about addressing because I think, um, so often when we think of renewable energy um, and a clean energy future, we think of how we can be the most energy efficient and innovative. Um, but I think it's still really important that we consider the voices that are being left out um, and ensure that there's equal access to renewable energy as well as energy in general. Um, so that's something I'm really looking forward to pursuing in the future. Thank you for being an advocate for that, Rachel, and for speaking for those that, that whose voices aren't heard on this because it is a justice issue. I mean, at Bedford 2030, we were lucky to be able to migrate, you know, in the next 10 years, we want to migrate to 100% green energy. We can do ener home energy audits on our house. We can put in energy efficient windows. We can put in solar and geothermal. We're really fortunate and really privileged. And it's very important that what that, that cause that you believe in so deeply, Rachel, thank you. Um, so we do have some questions. Oh, perfect, my chat just came up. We do have some questions from the um, audience. So feel free to, to weigh in audience if you have other questions. Oh, this is a great one. Can you share four or five actions we can all take in Bedford during Earth Week? Well, I will, I will start with coming to our Earth Day event on May 2nd. It's from noon to four at the Bedford Hills train station. It's family friendly and totally free. There's gonna be all kinds of activities and crafts for the kids. Our partner, um, sister organization, Healthy Yards, puts on the most incredible event. And they've brought together so many different community groups like Westmoreland Sanctuary and Audubon and a host of others, all coming together to promote this Earth Day celebration. So there will be a plant swap, a pollinator pop-up, composting native plants, it's gonna be awesome. So that's one thing that you can, um, you can do. And how about if each of our panelists picks one thing that we could do? How about Rachel? Sure. Um, I think on the topic of food waste, um, one thing that I know uh, I do here on campus and something we do back home um, is uh, it's to make bread like last longer. I think usually a loaf of bread that's fresh lasts about five days without getting moldy in a pantry. Um, but what we do at home and what we do here is we put it in the freezer um, if you just have sliced bread in the freezer, it lasts so much longer and you're cutting back on that much food waste and you're saving a lot more money because um, it can last much, much longer, like up to a few months um, if you put it in the freezer as opposed to the pantry. Thank you, Rachel. That's a good tip. That's awesome. How about you, Riley? What's one good thing that, some, that our audience can do in Earth, uh, Earth Week? So something I think is really important is I've noticed recently that there's a lot of plastic that ends up on the side of our roads. And I think sometimes me and my family, we like to go around and pick up all of that plastic just to get it off of our roads and hopefully recycle it if it's recyclable, just to help get rid of all that unnecessary plastic that's on the side of our roads and clean up the environment. That's 
Um, that's an excellent one. How about you, Jasmine? Um, well, one big thing for me is that a lot of people don't really understand how much energy goes into eating meat. And I've been a pescatarian for over a year. And I think maybe something easy that you can do is just cut back on the meat, maybe have meatless Mondays, because you maybe you don't even realize it, but you might eat meat every day, or maybe for two or three meals a day too. And that it's a, it's a lot of energy. So meatless Mondays can help cut back a lot. That is excellent. And a couple of years ago, Bedford 2030 did do a program called Meatless Mondays in um, partnership with, with Johns Hopkins University. And it was wildly successful. I'm totally spacing on how many families we had that actually signed up to do it. But we it was really impactful. And I think that families truly learned that a plant-based diet can help the planet. And we're not saying don't eat meat, we're just saying eat less of it, right? Awesome. Um, Sarah, how about you? I mean, this is what you've been doing in your sustainability club. I'm sure this week has been crazy for you doing this. So what, what have you been teaching the kids at John Jay to do? Um, I think staying on the theme of food, a really simple thing you could just try out is buying a plant-based um, milk alternative. I think that people think it's, oh, like kind of like hippie, kind of vegan to, to do that, but, and there's kind of a whole stigma around it, but really a lot of them taste very similar and they're much better for the environment, specifically coconut milk and oat milk are much better for the environment. And it doesn't cost very much if you just pick it up and you give it a try and then you, you never know like your kids might like it even more than regular milk or you might like it more than regular milk and you can use it in your recipes and it's a really kind of easy switch and you might end up really enjoying it and it's much better for the environment if your family would continue to use that than um, regular milk. Absolutely. I made the switch and my kids didn't even notice. So give it a whirl out there, parents. <laughs> Just don't show them the uh, the bottle. <laughs> did I get everybody's one thing that they can do? Yes, I did. Awesome. Um, so let's take some more questions from the audience. So these are um, some of them really deep and interesting. Um, Oh, so what are some of the most exciting green careers to think about for the future so that you can translate your passion from your teenage years into your career years? Um, does anybody want to, I don't want to put you guys all on the spot for that, but um, does anybody want to take that one? Yeah, I can take that one. Um, so I think for me, uh, being really interested in energy and policy, uh, something that's really exciting is the work that's being done um, in the current administration in the uh, Department of Energy. Um, there was actually a professor um, at Northeastern who recently um, joined the Biden administration um, as the Director of Energy Justice as a part of the Department of Energy. Um, so that's, to me, really inspiring that now we're giving more importance to energy justice and um, we're investing more in renewable energy. Um, so I see uh, um, there are a lot of engineers that join the Department of Energy, but um, I think that's like a really exciting um, link between um, engineering and data science as well as um, in intro to policy. That is excellent. Thank you, Rachel. And for all of our panelists, one final question is really, you know, look into the camera and what advice do you have for other youth voices that want their voice to be heard on to bring climate action now, whether it's like Jasmine into her home and her daily life, whether it's like Riley, who's working with the town and the community, whether it's Sarah that is working with her school and campus, or whether it's Rachel who's ready to bring that kind of energy justice to, to underserved um, countries and communities. So what advice do you have for the youth out there? Yeah. Something, something that I would say is kind of cliche, but really use the resources that you have available to you. You might not even realize um, how many 
resources you have to spread the word about your project or your idea. Um, especially like I think something I learned through my various projects with Sustainability Club is social media is such a big thing. And I think it's the best way to get out and like spread the word about your project and your ideas and get followers and um, get people understanding what you're trying to accomplish and, and trying to help you out. And so I think like everybody has Instagram and you can also use like your school email or your or um, parents emails in the district for in my case, because um, it was a school thing, but you can use email and text and stuff like that. But not everybody always checks their inbox, especially if they're um, younger and part of like our our age group. Um, so definitely Instagram, everybody's always checking their feed and refreshing. And so I think really using using social media is a definitely a big way to get people to support you and also just reaching out to teachers and, and um, also just like other adults in your community. It kind of sounds like scary and like social anxiety and all that stuff but really it's it's not that intimidating and a lot of people will be willing to help you out if you just put yourself out there and just like um go up to them or, or write an email to them explaining your idea and a lot of people will be willing to support you so just really trying to use whatever resources you have available to you there's a lot more potential than you might think there is for your project to be successful that is really great advice, Sarah. And I'm sure as um, the director of your sustainability committee for your school, you come up against dealing with your peers that may or may not be as invested in, in these issues or care as much. So those are some really good tactics to help them to understand that and to help, help them to, to join you. Um, Bed for 2030 is all about behavior change. And so you guys are all creating behavior change whether it was in your Green Highlight projects or in your life. And um, I'm just so proud and honored to know you and to see you grow through, through the years. Um, Jasmine, do you have um, any tactics to, to help inspire the next generation of, of youth leaders or to help your peers understand the importance of some of these issues when they're not so into it as we are? Um, I would say for the next generation out there watching this, um, definitely just step out of your comfort zone. Don't see what inspires you and allow it to take you wherever you want it to. And if you want, like I kind of said this before, but if you really want something, you have to push for it because it's most things don't really come that easily. But if you really push for it and are passionate about it, people will see how much you care. And it all starts with you because many people are always like, I don't wanna do this. It's not gonna make that much of a difference. But if everyone has that ment mentality, I don't know if that's the right word, and nothing's gonna change, but it all starts with you from within and you just have to make the change yourself. And with that, you'll inspire others and it'll all grow from there. So just keep, being strong yourself because you can do it yourself. <laughs> Absolutely. That is real. It's true. You have to know yourself before you can, you know, you have to heal yourself before you can heal the planet, right? That is awesome. And Riley, for for the 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 closer on, you know, what do you say that a next generation of environmental stewards or for peers that don't understand the importance of recycling, right? With Riley. I think it's really important to kind of going back to what Sarah said is using your resources because there's so many, if you want to get involved and make climate action happen, there's so many resources like different internships and green light to get involved with the environment. And if you're trying to execute a project as a young person who might not have as as much experience, it can be very helpful to turn to someone who has more experience. Like for example, I turned to the town board to get approvals and advice on how to work with different businesses and communities for my project. So I think that definitely helped me a lot. That is amazing. Well, we are all, we are all here to help you along your journey and we're so proud of you for being climate warriors and for being like 
young women power because women will save the world. So way to go. And thank you so much for being participants in the Greenlight Award, for being environmental stewards for this planet and for being part of tonight. So I hope everybody out there that's watching will pick one climate action that they learned tonight or that you learned from our website. And definitely check out the Low Waste Exhibit in Pound Ridge this weekend, the Earth Day Festival May 2nd, um, that's happening with the Healthy Yards Project in Bedford 2030 and a host of other organizations. We are all here to meet you where you are to inspire climate action now. Thank you so much and have a great night. Thank you, Sarah, for, uh, for doing a great job with the moderating. Super, thanks for having us, Dan. No problem, our pleasure. Everybody look for the recording in the next couple of days. We'll send that link around. Thank you. And check out the website. Have a good night.